The following video was recorded on Friday, February 23rd at 11.58 a.m. Really? Economists believe inflation is going to go down? Are you kidding me? This is Macroeconomic Solutions. He may be blind, but let him show you what you can't see. Stay ahead of the market and defend your wealth from the looming economic burdens crippling our economy today. Hello, my name is Michael Anthony Francis, and I'm the CEO of Macroeconomic Solutions, LLC, here in Las Vegas. And we're going to discuss today how incredible it is that economists and the market all want to believe that inflation is going to go down. Talk about wishful thinking. Additionally, we're going to talk a little bit about the, the most recent report of CPI and core CPI. Then we're going to get to the PCE report. That is the personal consumption expense report coming out on Thursday and what the market anticipates. And we're going to try and figure out the psychology of the market. There's a challenge for all of us, right? But before we get started, we'd like to introduce Joshua Norday. Joshua serves as the Director of Investor Relations with Macroeconomic Solutions. Joshua, how are you doing today? Very good. Thanks for having me, Mike. It's great to have you. Joshua, why don't you tell our audience a little bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm originally a Zimbabwean, fully born, bred, educated that side. And then I moved to South Africa. Since I've been in the business world, essentially, I've come through Dale Carnegie. I've been involved in various business structuring, insurances, international investments. I've been a director of sales for a major company in the e-com space, um, as well as business incubation, venture capital. And of course, now we're also getting into a bit of a private equity with what we're doing. But yeah, coming across you and seeing everything that's going on here, how could I say no to partnering with you, Mike? It's great to have you on board too. So, so just before we get deep dive into it, uh, how do you feel? How many times do you feel, uh, uh, Joshua, that the United States Federal Reserve is going to lower the Fed rate th this year? What what would be your expectation? Look, based on everything we're seeing around the market and what's being said by look some very big names as we've come across, you would expect it to be four, but. Mm -hmm. You and I both know, and we've discussed this at length. It's probably going to be more like two. You're exactly right. Who who was it that we found that said that it's going to drop by a hundred basis points? Was that Morgan Stanley? That that was Morgan Stanley. Yeah. Uh, you know what? Why don't you play that clip for us? This is Morgan Stanley's estimate of how many times, how how far down a full one percent that the Fed is going to cut the rate. Let's hear what they have to say. Go ahead and roll it there, Joshua. At the January Fed meeting, Chair Powell said continued disinflation like in prior months was needed to cut, but he also emphasized that disinflation needs to be sustainably on track, not simply touching 2%. Until Thursday's retail sales data, the market narrative began to flirt with a possible reacceleration of the U.S. economy, spoiling that latter condition of inflation going sustainably to target. January inflation data showed strength in services in particular, and payrolls showed a tight labor market that might pick up steam. The retail sales data pushed in the opposite direction, and we think that the slower growth will prevail over time. And for now, market pricing is more or less consistent with our call for 100 basis points of cuts this year starting in June. There you go. There it is. That was Morgan Stanley. What was the name of that episode so our uh, viewers can look it up? It is an Atlantic-sized divide in monetary policy. There you go. So Morgan Stanley is forecasting, beginning in June, no, nonetheless, that the, the Fed's going to reduce the, uh, the rate by 100 basis points. That means four cuts at 25 basis points apiece. You and I met with a client who was believing that exact um, sentiment um, to their own detriment. Yeah. 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 And so, and you can't blame them. That's Morgan Stanley, right? So why is it that we at Macroeconomic Solutions and I as the blind economist feel differently? Well, well I'll give you just a couple of real easy reasons. Let's, let's start with um, 
we'll, 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 we'll start with the very easy stuff. We'll start in the, the shallow end of the pool. So on the 15th, the, uh, the market anticipated that jobless, claim, jobless claims would come in at 216,000. Instead, it came in surprising the market below that at 212,000. Now, Joshua, next Thursday, what are they anticipating it to be? 206. Yeah. They, it, it, is that wishful thinking or what? It keeps going down, but they, they don't want to keep pace with, with the drop. They, they somehow think that there's going to be more jobless claims than there really are. If it came in at 201, I'll tell you what, Joshua, I wouldn't be surprised if it comes in below 200. So that's just jobless claims. So we can see that the market's expectation of jobless claims, which of course leads us to the unemployment rate, which most recently was reported as shocking 3.7. It's been below 4% now for the longest time. It hasn't been below 4% since this long, since the Vietnam War. And for those of you that don't know, that was a war in Southeast Asia. <laughs> you might be a little too young. So let's move on to CPI. The, the CPI, Consumer Price Index, was anticipated to come in at 2.9%. Well, the entire market was disappointed because it actually came in at 3.1%. That's the consumer price index. But then the more important number was core CPI. That's the, con the consumer price index with food and energy stripped out because of the volatility of food and energy. It was at previously at 3.9%. So Joshua, without cheating, don't look. What would you anticipate <laughs> that the market... Yeah, that's right, my brother. Don't look. You know, Don't be searching Google. What would you anticipate? Now, it was 3.9. What do you think the market was anticipating? Or CPI, Consumer Price Index, to come in at? What would you guess? Yes. Putting them under pressure, yeah, Mike. Um, I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah. going to wing it and go with 3.7. You nailed it, bro. You nailed it. I, 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 you know, I'm blind, so I can't tell if you're looking it up on Google, but we'll, we'll go with that. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, you nailed it. You nailed it. But instead, it came in at 3.9, and the market dropped by over a percent the next day because... They know by that strong inflationary rate of, you know, core CPI coming in at 3.9, that's going to put the idea of cutting the, the rate by the Federal Reserve by Jerome Powell and company as a distant dream, right? Jerome Powell said many times they need more additional evidence to, to give them the confidence they need to cut the rate. Well, when it comes to inflation, the market is still in that wishful thinking mode. And next week on, when's it coming out, Joshua? Did we say, was it Thursday? PCE, the personal consumption expense? Yeah, it's set for Feb 29th, next week, Thursday. Right. So the last day of February. Well, that's quite the way to end February. So again, sticking to this inflation theme, we are now going to talk about the PCE numbers that are coming in on Thursday. We're going to look at headline PCE and what the market is anticipating and core PCE. PCE, again, is the personal consumption expense. That's the basket of goods that consumers actually buy. Last time, headline PCE came in at 2.6 and core PCE came in at 2.9. Uh, frustratingly, a little bit high. It's not incredibly difficult to get from 9 point something to 3.0. That's not where the difficulty begins. The difficulty begins when you're trying to get from 3 to 2, and that's the Fed's target rate. And we all know, we all know that the preferred index of the Federal Reserve is the core personal consumption expense because that's the basket of goods that consumers actually spend their money on with food and energy stripped out because food and energy are too volatile to set monetary policy. With all of that buildup, Joshua, tell us, what is the market anticipating? Market is anticipating PCE of 2.4 and core PCE of 2.8. Right. And so they're expecting core PCE to come down by a tenth, and they're expecting headline PCE to come, up, come down by two tenths of a percent. How is that possible when 
oil, when energy is more expensive than it was last month. I think we checked it before the recording of this episode. It was about $83 a barrel. So yeah. how how is headline PCE going to go down? When And, and I don't know about you, Joshua, but when, when I go to the grocery store, I'm not seeing a whole lot of goods and services go down. I'll tell you what's going down is the size of packaging, but not, not the actual cost of uh, food. And so headline PC, again, the market's going to be grossly disappointed. That's a lot of wishful thinking that they think that headline PCE is going to go down to 2.4. And here's the real struggle, Joshua. They think it's going to go down to 2.4. And so the Federal Reserve's target rate, as you know, is, is 2%. And so that's why they expect the Fed to cut the rate by 100 basis points this year because they think we're coming down quickly enough and sustainably enough to justify a cut. But here's a question I got for you, Josh. Yeah. Do you think that they want the rate to come down because it would balance the economy or are they looking for short-term gain? What's your thought? Well, look, right now, judging by what Jerome Powell's actually been saying is the U.S. is in on an unsustainable trajectory, right? And I think he's trying to balance things out as much as possible because he sees this as, I mean, a major problem. And yes, he always says he doesn't get politics involved. But what I'm seeing is that he's trying to control things as much as possible. And quite frankly, it's not happening. I mean, if we're going to maybe wrap a bow on a few of these things, even the jobless claims, it's going down, but yes, there's multiple people, even both, let's say, husband and wife for simplicity's sake, working multiple jobs, two or three jobs, just to be able to carry their households, right? You talk about the food and energy and everything like that, and I think that's affecting everything. Well, that that's 100% true. But in the United States, uh, consumers are 70% of the economy, and in the United States, they, they want to keep up with their neighbors and they are going to do whatever they have to do to have the latest gadgets. If they have to work two to three jobs to make it happen, that's what they're going to do. That's that's the culture of this country. Now, they're anticipating PCE to come down. I gravely disagree. I, I think, if anything, it'll stay the same, if not go up. And uh, core PCE, they're expecting it to drop to 28 it's a possibility, but I doubt it. In either case, none of that is sustainable deceleration of inflation to motivate the Federal Reserve to remove, or excuse me, to motivate the Federal Reserve to reduce the rate by 25 basis points anytime soon. Let's go ahead and get a clip of Jerome Powell's most recent statement on this very topic. Inflation has eased <clears throat> notably over the past year, but remains above our longer run goal of 2%. Total PCE prices rose 2.6% over the 12 months ending in December. Excluding the volatile food and energy categories, core PCE prices rose 2.9%. The lower inflation readings over the second half of last year are welcome, but we will need to see continuing evidence to build confidence that inflation is moving down sustainably toward our goal. Longer term inflation expectations appear to remain well anchored as reflected in a broad range of surveys of households, businesses and forecasters, as well as measures from financial markets. <clears throat> the Fed's monetary policy actions are guided by our mandate to promote maximum employment and stable prices for the American people. My colleagues and I are acutely aware that high inflation imposes significant hardship as it erodes purchasing power especially for those least able to meet the higher costs of essentials, like food, housing, and transportation. We're highly attentive to the risks that high inflation poses to both sides of our mandate, and we're strongly committed to returning inflation to our 2% objective. There you, there you go. go, Mike. So what are your thoughts on that commentary? Well, look, I think what he's saying is right. If they can't control inflation, what we've just talked about, having two, three jobs, multiple jobs, both husband, wife, whoever, trying to control all of this is going to create a massive, massive issue. And like we even spoke about in a meeting yesterday with one of our potential clients, is that 
interest rate hikes, especially in real estate, are hurting the market deeply. Mm -hmm. But what, what I get from Jerome Powell there, and this is perhaps due to the fact that I'm blind, certain words he said with strength, acutely aware, sustainably. When you listen to that, when you see the focus on the words that he emphasizes, it's clear they have no intention of bringing that Fed rate down anytime soon. Here's, here's the issue, Joshua. There were multiple times in the 1970s where it would seem like they received good data for a reasonable length of time, and the Fed would then lower the rates, and inflation kept popping back up like what a whack a like a whack a mo game. You know, I don't know if you've ever seen those court those games you play at the arcade of whack a mo. And, and inflation yeah. just kept popping back up in the 70s like that. You know, and it, it got worse and worse and worse. It got into double digit inflation, of course, until Paul Volcker went uh, came along and. He had to force the economy into a serious recession in order to correct the problem. And, and the Fed is suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder from the 1970s. They don't want to ever see that happen again. Nobody wants to be the next Paul Volcker, you know. So yeah. let's go ahead and, and see uh, the next piece of what Jerome Powell said, and then we'll wrap it up. It will likely be appropriate to begin dialing back policy restraint at some point this year. But the economy has surprised forecasters in many ways since the pandemic, and ongoing progress toward our 2% inflation objective is not assured. The economic outlook is uncertain, and we remain highly attentive to inflation risks. We are prepared to maintain the current target range for the federal funds rate for longer, if appropriate. Okay, Josh, I'm going to ask you, pick out some terms that caught your attention. Well, look, I mean, you, you diving into this, Jerome said sometime this year. Yeah, I love that one. Sometime this year. You know, that's, you know, you, you, it's like me telling my wife, you know what, honey, we're, we're going to go to the Bellagio and have a dinner at, at Picasso's sometime this year. You know, <laughs> maybe, you know, that, that's a real maybe. Yeah. And then I loved how he jumped in and said, the market has been continually surprised by the by the the strength. It's been surprising to the economists, to everyone involved. Any other yeah. terms jump out to you? I mean, continuous inflationary risks. Yeah, they're having, yeah. They're and, having to be highly attentive. Yeah, yeah, and uncertainty. He he mentioned uncertainty. Wow, there's nothing the market hates more than uncertainty. I'll tell you the one I loved he wrapped up with. Uh, how did he say it, Josh? He said they will maintain the higher rates longer if appropriate. And he said yeah. that with a little power in his voice, didn't he? Yeah. He did. Yeah. He's he's definitely pushing on these few words. And I mean, it just sounds like one big gray game. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> and, and, and so what's remarkable to me, and not to pick on Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs is doing the same thing, as are many others. Um, what's re now, I'll tell you who's not, not forecasting that way is J.P. Morgan Investments. They, they, they are not in the same camp. As you know, Josh, that, that's where I came from. And um, yeah. I, I'm in agreement with J.P. Morgan. And, and when you're managing $3.9 million trillion of you know, assets under management, you can say what you really think. You don't have an agenda. But, but and I, I truly believe that um, in, a, in a world where nothing goes wrong, it's possible it could happen three times. Let's pretend in that hypothetical world that it comes down three times at 75 basis points. Here's the yeah. problem, Joshua. The 10-year Treasury, as you and I were discussing yesterday, has gone up by 30 basis points. Last time I checked, as of this morning, it was at 4.303, the 10-year Treasury. So the Treasury is going up, and that's because demand around the globe for the 10-year Treasury yield is not the yield. Demand for the Treasury is dropping, causing the yield to go up. And that's, of course, due to the negative credit ratings that uh, the United States has collected uh, last year. And it looks like they're going to get it again from uh, Moody's this year. So... Josh, do you think that yeah. uh, the Fed's going to move the rate down by much, or what is your personal thought? 
Look, I don't see it going down by much anytime soon. No. I don't see any of these predictions really coming to light. And to me, honestly, it's a bit of lies, lines, and statistics, right? They're giving the market oh, yeah. something to grab on and really hoping for the best. That maybe in the excitement, it stirs a bit of activity. I mean, you see it every single day, people are grabbing for money in the VC, PE, and acquisition space. We're right. seeing it. It, it, and now to me, Josh, it's okay to hope for the best, but if you're strategic at all, even in the yeah. military sense, you hope for the best, but you plan for the worst. Absolutely. You plan for the absolute worst. You hope for the best. Of course you want the best. And if that happens, wonderful. You plan for the worst and hopefully it lands somewhere in between. And yes, the rate will come down, but in the, in the words of Jerome Powell, possibly sometime this year you know <laughs> if appropriate so that's it yeah i love it yeah yeah and, and so joshua thank you for being on this episode and by the way how can people reach out to you look it's really easy to find me on linkedin joshua norde um my name's in the url as well otherwise you can just send me an email joshua at the blind economist Dot com. Very good. And then, of course, you can find us on LinkedIn, YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, all of those things. You can find me simply by typing in Michael Anthony Francis in your browser. I'll pop up at the top. That'll take you straight into my LinkedIn. And like Joshua, you can reach me at Michael at TheBlindEconomist.com. As always, wisdom is the proper application of knowledge Knowledge alone is never enough. Inform yourself, educate yourself, and prepare yourself so that you can deal with the economic issues that are absolutely going to present themselves. If you've prepared yourself, your family, your business, you'll weather the storm. If you don't, if you're hoping for the best, you'll suffer the calamity. Until next time, this is Michael Anthony Francis, the CEO of Macroeconomic Solutions. We'll see you on the flip side. Video production brought to you by the blind economist and scriptwriter, Michael Anthony Francis, editor and production specialist, Erin Cunningham, and the behind the scenes team at Macroeconomic Solutions. The blind economist, Boris, Shaffin, John, Cassie, and Jared. Co host on today's episode, Joshua Nord. The content, analysis, and opinions expressed herein are for informational and educational purposes only and should not be considered investment advice. While every effort is taken to ensure the information provided in these podcasts is accurate and reliable, the blind economist cannot warrant the accuracy, completeness, or reliability of information presented. Information and opinions expressed in these podcasts are, as of the date of the recording, subject to change without notice and may become outdated. Investing involves risks, including the possible loss of the principal amount invested. Past performance is not an indicative of future results, which may vary. You should not make any financial investment, trading, or other decisions without undertaking independent due diligence and consultation with a professional broker or competent financial advisor.